Supreme Court has twice before ruled against the Bush administration on this seminal issue, but never as panoramically as in its decision today. Our fourth story on the countdown. Detainees at Guantanamo Bay, non-U.S. citizens, do have the right under the U.S. Constitution to challenge their detentions in civilian U.S. courts. This according to the nation's highest court. In a moment, Jonathan Turley assesses just how critical this ruling really is. The Supreme Court by 5 to 4 today saying that the Bush administration is violating the rights of 270 prisoners at the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base who are being held indefinitely and without charges. Justice Anthony Kennedy, writing for the court, rejected the notion that the threat of terrorism trumps the rule of law. Quoting, the laws and constitution are designed to survive and remain in force in extraordinary times. Furthermore, the court deemed unconstitutional a 2006 law passed by the then Republican Congress, which had stripped Gitmo prisoners of the right to habeas corpus. The majority also rejected the government position that a limited judicial review set up by Congress was adequate to protect detainee rights. President Bush, speaking from Italy today, said that he would abide by the court's decision, but he did not stop there. That doesn't mean I have to agree with it. It's a deeply divided court. Uh, and I strongly agree with those who dissented that uh, and their dissent was based upon their serious concerns about U.S. national security. And we'll study this opinion and uh, we'll do so with this in mind to determine whether or not additional legislation might be appropriate. The Justice Department has now responded in a statement that reads in part, quote, while we disagree with the ruling, it is important to note that the case did not concern military commission trials. Military commission trials will therefore continue to go forward. As promised, let's call in George Washington University law professor and constitutional law expert Jonathan Turley. John, good evening. Hi, Keith. All right, how far-reaching is this decision and does it in fact fully restore habeas corpus? Well, you know, when you say far-reaching, this is sort of like beating a diagnosis of terminal cancer. You, you didn't mm -hmm. gain much, but you didn't lose what you had. And what we almost lost here by a hair's breadth of one vote was the great writ of habeas corpus, at least for these detainees. And I think what we really gained here is credibility. That is, we show the world that having an idiot-proof system doesn't mean you don't have idiots. It means you can transcend them. It means that you have a legal system that can be better than its leaders. But we came awfully close close. Now, by restoring this right, it means these people will be able to go into a real court and face real judges and have real law applied. But the details still have to be worked out, and this is going to take years. And, and obviously, this is a president who is not going to go quietly into this night. To read the dissent, however, you would have thought that all 270 of the detainees at Guantanamo were freed by this, right. by this verdict. This, yeah. was, this was, I don't know, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson or something. What actually <laughs> is, what is their status now, what is, and where are military commissions, which uh, justice says is going to continue? Well, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm surprised by Scalia's dissent. Uh, Roberts also wrote a dissent. But Scalia's dissent, when contrasted with the eloquence of Justice Kennedy, he wrote 70 pages. It was a tour de force of the Great Writ. And when compared to that, Scalia's opinion comes off as sort of a snarling you know, tirade. It's pretty obnoxious. It, he suggests that you know, it, it's almost as if the World Trade Centers would still be standing if it wasn't for habeas corpus. Well, of course, habeas corpus existed then, uh, and the president tried to roll back now. But that's not the reason uh, those attacks occurred. But the suggestion that people will die because we're giving legal process to those who we've accused is a really bizarre and obnoxious thought. Uh, but I think ultimately history will judge poorly that opinion of, of Justice Scalia. He has some very good opinions. That just doesn't have to be one of them. Uh, the president says that um, he may once again have Congress address this, I imagine, with less success than he did in 2006. But, but did Congress not sort of get slapped down today for not adequately hewing to a previous decision? Yeah, that's what's often missed in the news coverage. This is not just a condemnation of the president. It's a condemnation of Congress. I was absolutely shocked when Congress stepped in and tried to assist the president after the last round by wiping out habeas corpus, Democrats and Republicans. And what we really need at this point is a Hippocratic oath in Congress not to do any harm to the Constitution. They should just leave it alone. If we really are fighting for something, if they believe in our 
system of, of government. Why not allow the courts to do what courts do, to judge guilt and to do it in a way that we show who we are, not who these detainees are, but to show that even when we hate people or fear people, it doesn't change who we are or how we try them. And to that point, that which terrified all of us, you and me particularly sitting here in, in late 2006, the government going around, under, over, through the Constitution. After today, how much of it is still in play? Well, I'm afraid that there is a great deal of circumvention still going on. We have the unlawful surveillance program, the torture program, the abuse of state secrets, uh, and also Congress has radically cut back the ability of courts to do what courts do, to look at the constitutionality of what this administration has done and continues to do. So there's a great amount of work, but what we had today is that we had an example that, you know, we have in a beautiful, brilliant system that has failed safe mechanisms. In this case, we came down to the very last one. We had a failure in the executive branch, a failure in the legislative branch, and we had a failure in the judicial branch that was only saved in the end by five justices. Now, that's a real Burma shave when it comes to a constitutional crisis, but it worked. Uh, but we need to look at these other areas and try to regain what we have lost. As Wellington said, it was a near-run thing. Jonathan Turley of George Washington <laughs> University. Thank you, John. Thanks, Keith.